Emissions control options for above ground storage tanks with speaker Adam Vance of Mesa Industries Incorporated. Adam is an experienced leader, technical expert, and innovator in the petroleum industry. In his current senior management role at Mesa Industries Inc., Adam leads business innovation, engineering, and quality. Adam's team designs top quality custom engineered solutions for tank drain hoses, seals, and fabrics. He consults in and out of the field with global oil industry customers to find innovative storage solutions. Adam also led the successful integration of industry leaders WG Seals into Mesa's engineered tank products division. Adam's past experiences include 15 years of engineering, operations, and management experience. His experience includes products and services supplied to the upstream, midstream, and downstream industry sectors. He holds a BS in mechanical engineering, as well as certifications in continuing education in advanced product quality planning, Six Sigma, value stream mapping, Toyota production system, statistical stability and capability, and failure mode effect analysis. Without further ado. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, we will be talking today about mission control options for above ground storage tanks. We have, um, this isn't intended to maybe be a tanks 101 course, um, but maybe take a little bit of a different perspective on emissions control products. So who is this guy? Um, Adam Vance, I've been in upstream, midstream, downstream, um, mostly in, in drilling early on in, in my career with uh, hydraulics, particularly with Parker Hannafin, um, with uh, blowout preventers in, in specifically. Uh, moved on to M.I. Swaco, a Schlumberger company, again, in the drilling sector where we did products like chokes, um, rotating control devices, shakers, things like that. So anything drilling mud related as it came back out of uh, the standpipe, uh, we processed that, products for that. Now with Mesa ETP uh, involved with the WG Seals integration, which uh, is where emissions control products comes into play engineering, operations, manufacturing, quality, and new product development. So the agenda today, we're gonna uh, talk about a few different things with emissions control. So what is vapor pressure and what does it have to do with emissions? What impacts emissions rates? What do emission control devices actually do? Uh, what control devices are available? What are organic aerosols? And then some future considerations. So we'll, we hear the term read vapor pressure, true vapor pressure. Uh, we typically focus on read vapor pressure when we're talking about volatility of products stored. Um, so what exactly is read vapor pressure? It's an ASTM test, ASTM D323. And what we have um, is a chamber that is completely sealed. We have a four to one vapor to liquid ratio. So um, we have the liquid down here and a large vapor space. We heat it to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and then we wait and see what the equilibrium pressure is. So as this, uh, the vapor um, evaporates and condenses, reaches equilibrium, whatever this equilibrium pressure is, is what we call, call the RVP pressure. Some examples, you'll see RVP 7, 10, or 13 in particular to gasoline. So does this mean that emissions control devices contain 7 PSI, 10 PSI, or 13 PSI? The answer is no. So what exactly impacts emissions rate? If we're not holding back pressure, what are, we, what are we really doing and what are we trying to do with emissions here? So we've got three variables. First one is temperature. As we increase the temperature, the emissions will increase. And why is that? Because as, the incre as we increase temperature, we increase vapor pressure. So going back to the read vapor pressure test, we applied 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, to get that certain pressure. If we applied 80 degrees Fahrenheit, we would have a lower pressure. If we applied 120 degrees Fahrenheit, we would have a higher pressure. Surface area. 
increased surface area equals increased emissions. And why is that? Because emissions only happen at the liquid surface. So if we have a, a liquid surface that is here, we'll have less emissions than if it's a, a larger surface area. And then finally, air movement. So increased air movement increases the emissions. Why is that? Because wind or air movement removes emission vapors and lowers the saturation, which promotes additional emissions. All of these things, uh, conceptually, you can think about with water. So if you um, put a large dish, dish of water outside, it would evaporate very quickly. If you had um, a small surface area dish of water outside, it would evaporate much more slowly. If you ran air over it, um, it would evaporate much, much more quickly. So a similar type of uh, phenomenon going on with emissions. So what do emission control devices actually do? What are we actually trying to accomplish with these devices that we have in our tanks? Are we impacting the temperature? No. Are we, in, uh, are we adjusting the surface area? So when we have a floating roof, uh, we have divine, defined tank geometry. We have a designed rim space. We have designed gauge pull wells. Those are features of the floating roof that are there in the design. So typically, we are not really affecting the surface area. Mostly, there's a couple examples that I'll show later on where we actually do impact the surface area of the, of the liquid. Air movement uh, is really what we're, what we're trying to knock down with emission control devices. So are we really keeping emissions in the tank with emissions control devices, or are we really just trying to keep the air out? We're trying to block the air movement. So uh, standards uh, 40 CFR 60 K sub B um, handles uh, some of the standards for VOC storage. We have uh, a chart here which shows the volume requirements and what the vapor pressures um, are that we are supposed to um, control with this K sub B document, um, which covers a lot of the uh, uh, emissions control device requirements. You can see that the barrel um, is, is pretty low. so. Most of the time, we're in this top area with uh, three quarters of a PSI vapor pressure to 11.1 .1 PSI. So are all VOCs equal? Um, this is a little bit of a busy chart here, uh, but and it's not uh, don't don't hold me to be exactly accurate and scaled. Um, but we have very volatile organic compounds, things like propane and butane, that want to be uh, gaseous in their natural state. They have a high vapor pressure, low boiling point. Uh, VOCs um, is what we're typically talking about. Um, benzenes, toluenes, uh, small organic compounds that are in this uh, vapor pressure range of uh, 0 to 15. We have uh, an area called intermediate volatile organic compounds, um, where we're getting larger compounds. Hexadecane it is, uh, is an example of that. And then semi-volatile, larger compounds, less volatile. Um, dibutyl phthalate is, is an example of that. It's more of a plasticizer. So gasoline um, will be in here, and gasoline is a mixture of a lot of compounds. So your, your benzenes and your toluenes are, are what is your um, that type of product is what is gassing off. And so a lot of it is tied to the size of the molecule. So here's a, a propane molecule. Um, benzene gets a little bit larger, a little more complex. Hexadecane, we are getting a lot, we're still carbon and hydrogen, a much larger molecule than the butyl uh, phthalate is uh, a little bit more complex. So as we get larger, it's, it's, the volatility goes down. So when we talk about uh, vapor pressures as well, um, when we think about the, the price of gasoline in the summer going up, and it, it's not because there's a conspiracy of when people start traveling that we're going to jack the gas prices up. Uh, we are reducing the vapor pressure of the gasoline 
for the summertime because as temperatures rise, more, more uh, propensity for the gasoline to evaporate. So we have to use a lower RBP gasoline in the summertime, uh, which is more expensive because uh, we have to refine that a little more. So that's, that's the real reason behind it. So typically uh, what we're dealing with is, is VOCs in this category. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about these intermediate and semi-volatile um, a little bit later. So here's my, my little graphic of, of a storage tank that has a lot going on that is not accurate. Uh, we have internal floating roof tank components in here. We've got external floating roof tanks and kind of show what some of the control devices are um, that we use. So this is a, a ladder gauge pole combination that you would find in an internal floating roof. Uh, this would be a deck leg, column, a vacuum breaker, and then a gauge pole. This blue is what we would have as a pontoon floating roof. And then all of the green arrows would be emissions points where we have, uh, we're not covering the liquid surface where we have um, potential for emissions to occur. So we add in the wind element, um, and that really, um, as we were talking about, one of the three elements that increase emissions rate is if we have wind that will pull a lot of these vapors out of the tank. If any of you have ever been in a, uh, in a tank in the wintertime, um, and you think that if the roof's landed, the wind will come right over the top of this tank and it won't, won't be very cold, but if, if you're in a tank in wintertime, I can guarantee you this wind swirls around in here and will pull vapors out of that tank um, pretty quickly. So here's, here's my little uh, crude drawing of a, a, a rim seal. So this would be like a mechanical shoe seal, secondary. What we're accomplishing here is covering up the surface area. This is the vapor fabric here. So um, main, main point of that one is to fill up that rim space while also allowing the roof to move in and out. So this seal is designed to move uh, plus or minus four inches uh, according to API. So we have to have a very flexible seal at that point. Um, we'll put flexible enclosures uh, over uh, ladders, uh, leg boots or leg socks over legs to block that wind access, gauge pull, uh, flexible cover, We'll put seals around column wells, again, trying to reduce the uh, access to, this, to the, uh, the air movement, gaskets around uh, vacuum breakers. Column sleeves um, do have uh, a little bit of reduction of surface area, so we're trying to eliminate this surface area around the gauge pole from being accessed from above. Uh, another uh, primary seal is called a foam log. Uh, we stick this into the rim space. Uh, it's basically a big chunk of foam wrapped in fabric. It will move in and out uh, that plus or minus four inches. Um, this is another example of, if, if you look at this, uh, we are actually reducing the surface area of the tank. And so when you uh, use a foam log and you look at the AP42 variables for emissions, this foam log liquid mounted is more efficient than this mechanical shoe seal. And the reason for it is because we are, not because it's a tighter seal across here, but we're reducing the surface area. If we moved this foam log into the liquid or the vapor space up here and we're not touching the liquid surface here, it actually is a similar efficiency as this, if not a little bit worse. So it's not the design of the foam log so much as its location. And then we'll have um, gauge pole floats. This is again reducing the surface uh, exposure of, of the fluid. So what happens to the emissions when they get out of the tank? Um, we have two things going on. We have the vapor and aerosols. So vapor is in the gas phase and aerosols are actually liquid particles uh, in the air. Um, we have organic aerosols um, in two categories. Primary organic aerosols are vehicle emissions um, from burning. Secondary organic aerosols are formed from gas to particle conversion and oxidized hydrocarbons. So these organic aerosols um, 
can form from these vapors that are uh, emitted into the atmosphere. Organic aerosols um, will, will def uh, reflect light, so we have, uh, it can cause haziness in the atmosphere. Um, it can promote uh, ozone um, formation. Ozone is great in the stratosphere, and, but on lower levels uh, poses health issues. So looking at secondary organic aerosols, um, some research shows that the formation can't be completely um, attributed to VOCs. So we're, we're controlling VOCs, um, but there's more organic aerosols in the atmosphere than can be attributed to just the VOCs themselves. So potentially the secondary organic aerosols um, can come from those intermediate or semi-volatile inter, semi uh, organic compounds or um, volatile organic compounds. And as we know, IVOC and SVOC are not covered um, in that case of B. So we have a, a lower emissions, or we have a lower vapor pressure uh, requirement for those. So there was some research done um, during the Deepwater Horizon um, incident where uh, uh, NOAA flew a couple of airplanes and gathered um, information about uh, the atmospheric conditions above the site over actually about two months after the, the spill started. And what they found um, is that VOCs were, were monitored and, and captured directly over where the spill site was but they also found secondary organic um, aerosols further down from where the spill site was, where the aged oil had drifted. So what, what the conclusion in this research paper was and what they, what they found was that this gave a nice time lapse um, of what happens to these compounds over time. So it's really difficult to pick out if uh, organic aerosols are coming from VOCs, um, toluenes, or, or things like that versus the larger chemical compounds. But this allowed um, a time lapse to show uh, VOCs coming out directly, um, fresh VOCs, and then aged VOCs. So uh, what we found is that uh, in this document that a lot of the SOA formation um, was being still created downwind or downstream of where the oil spill was in this sector and the estimation was it was from C14 to 16 hydrocarbons, uh, which uh, is beyond the VOC normals that we really uh, worry about in case of B, but more attributed to different uh, heavier fuels. So what are partial intermediate VOCs with those type of compounds? We have jet fuel, diesel fuel, fuel oils. Um, it's pointing to the fact that maybe all VOC, you know, we, we know all VOCs are volatile, um, but over time, IVOCs and SVOCs will emit and form uh, secondary organic aerosols. Um, we have some needs for additional research um, into what, where these things are coming from, but it, it's an interesting thing to look at. Uh, current technology for emissions control devices is already available that we have in the industry. Um, we have increasing scrutiny on our industry as we're moving into uh, the, the future. We know that uh, climate change is, is a big hot topic um, and it's an opportunity potentially for us to get out in, in front of it and say, hey, why don't we um, use some of these emissions control devices for some IVOC, SVOC storage. We're not worried so much about the evaporation loss, but we can say maybe we can knock down some of these compounds that may be getting into the atmosphere over time. So potentially normalize some emissions control devices um, for IVOC and SVOC heavy product storage. So again, the, the big takeaways are um, emissions control devices, most of them are to reduce airflow. Um, we have a few products that reduce the surface area. And when we reduce uh, more than one of those elements, um, surface area and airflow, we get a greater um, efficiency gain on that. Um, and uh, we have not put in, there's no temperature uh, adjustment that we, we typically have on emissions control devices. So that's a variable that moves up and down. So depending on the time of year. So with that, any questions that I can answer? Yes. So no, foam logs um, are not typically recommended. 
and it's because of of the longevity of them. So if we go back to the design of the foam log is, is foam inside and wrapped in fabric. And what happens uh, over time is the abrasion along this wall will compromise the fabric. At that point, the fluid ends up being sucked into the foam. So the, the seal fails um, and then becomes an environmental hazard that you have to dispose of. So. Uh, the recommendation is to go with these for the long longevity of them. Um, primary uh, mechanical shoe seals can last 10, 15 years. Foam logs, um, three to five, uh, depending on the conditions. So that's that's why we don't typically go with them. They're still they're still installed um, in certain conditions. Um, they are still in use, but not as not as prevalent as this. Yeah, um, I will. I will say that um, our industry is pretty conservative, and we've been using a lot of the same technology for a very long time. Um, I think that there, there is some R and D happening um, with some of these 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 products, but we're a, a little bit slower than than maybe some of the other sectors and new product development. As I think we. As we understand what we're really doing with these emissions control devices, we can look at it at a different angle and saying, okay, how can I tackle more than one of these factors that are attributed to emissions like surface area and wind reduction? So, um, yes. Question? Like the, the seal on the you have on the left, maybe you look at making it uh, semicircle on the bottom. Yeah, that, maybe that surface. The uh, the difficulty of and and some I will say some areas of the world have a requirement to mount them down here. Um, what what we have is an installation problem. Um, so if you've ever installed a seal or been on a floating roof, this could be uh, three or four feet. And now you've got to uh, get down here to attach it. And so uh, hard to install. And then also from a maintenance standpoint, you'd probably have to take the tank out um, if you wanted to work on it. So there's some, some issues with that as well. Yes. Has ethanol presented any, any, any issues with emission uh, control? Ethanol, uh, yes. It, what, what we run into with ethanol is really the compatibility with some of the materials that we're using. Um, and so typically you'll have uh, different fabrics uh, that can handle different type of things. So um, for, for this fabric here that we would use, on the primary seal or the leg socks, all this stuff, uh, foam log, urethane is pretty common. Um, that we, that can work with gasoline and crude oil, but is not compatible with with ethanol. And so we have Teflons, 
Um, Mesa has something called 7010 uh, Mesalon, which is uh, kind of a poly polyethylene material that is suitable for, for ethanol. Roughly the same with methanol. Right, yes. The, the problem with some of those products like Teflon is that um, Teflon doesn't have a lot of abrasion resistance. So if you tried to make a foam log with Teflon, it would last about five minutes, maybe. Yeah, so, yes? Have, there, have y'all done any studies on just the different, the seal materials at the different penetrations? And I mean, obviously, you know, how the tank operates, but just like what those in general. Um, that's a that's a good question. So um, we have seen um, some of these primary seals last 20 years, and then we've seen them last five. So there's so many different conditions that happen in the in the life of this tank. Seals on the rim, at least, are really susceptible to the design of this rim space. Um, all tanks created are, are different, and so uh, they're built on spot. Some of the roof, uh, some of the, uh, the shell caves in or caves out. And so the seals are put under a lot of stress. If it's caught on something, it can be damaged. Um, but typically, um, the fabric in a, in, a, in a good environment is can last quite a long time. Gasolines and things like that doesn't really impact it. Um, but it, there's there's a lot of things that can happen. How they, how they fill it, um, damage with wind, wind and weather events, uh, there's a million things that can happen. Another thing that can happen too is um, all these have their own own conditions that they're working in, and they all have potential failure modes that are different. Um, as as Dave was saying, the, these are susceptible to the, a lot of the environmental factors outside, so wind and snow and and rain. Um, these floats um, have have a potential of getting caught in here. Um, so if if they get twisted, then um, you're not going to get an accurate reading, or they might just get stuck. Uh, these these uh, gaskets will wear out, so it's all they're all under different um, forces uh, over time. Any other questions? Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Adam.